you, you, you expand it and then shift it down. Exactly right. I was, I was thinking the other way in my head. And what's this formal name? Is that signum. 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 Yeah, like magnum. Like signum. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're live. Welcome back. Um, we're almost done with uh, our, our chapter four. Yeah, chapter four on amplitude modulation. Uh, we may we may or may not touch a little bit on on FM today, but certainly certainly on Monday we will uh, we will get into uh, frequency modulation. So what that means for your weekend plans, among other things, is this would be a fabulous time. This weekend would be a fabulous time to uh, finish up your homework problems from chapter four and read casually. Read casually chapter five, uh, frequency modulation, so that you have some idea of, of Lati's notation and, and things of that nature. And truthfully, I don't think I'll spend a lot of, I, I think we'll be able to go through chapter five fairly quickly. Uh, there's just a couple of things that you can do with FM and, and, we'll, and, we'll, and, and phase modulation, and we'll cover those. And then we'll get into um, uh, digital, and then we'll get into noise. Now, uh, we need to start thinking about an exam, but not, not yet. Um, so I, I, I mostly just to relax you guys a little bit. I'd like to cover the first few sections of chapter five. I'll draw a line in the sand, and then from that day, we'll, I'll announce uh, uh, two weeks out to the exam. And so that, put, that puts our exam, uh, the next exam, somewhere in terms of, of April. Uh, I'm sorry, wait, March, April. Yeah, we're in March now, so, uh, so somewhere in the first, second week of April. So it's a little bit ways off, and I, so I don't want you to panic or worry about it. It will cover, chapter, it will cover all of Chapter 4 and a little bit of Chapter 5. I think that's, a, that's a kind of a good breaking point for an exam. Okay? So that's a little bit of, of, of what, what we have coming up ahead. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to I tie up um, today. I want to go back over... Um, the Hilbert transform that we talked about last time in the context of SSB, a single sideband. Uh, in, that, in that context, we looked at, at things in the frequency domain. Today, I want to look at them in the, in the um, I want to look at them in the time domain and exploit something about causal systems. And as you know, most real systems are, and, and all physical systems, are, are causal. And so the very nature of, them being, of a system being causal in time, non-anticipatory, uh, has very, very important ramifications as it pertains to the Hilbert transform on what the imaginary part is doing relative to the real part of the response. And I want to go over that, and I want, you to, I want to do so in a manner that you can take a look at S the SSB work we did last time and what we'll do with the, with the Hilbert transform and causality today, and you'll say, my goodness, they're just two sides of the same coin, the same mathematics is being applied to, this, to just two different problems, and boy, isn't that cool and neat. Okay, so it should serve as a review for SSB as well. Um, and then I think we'll get into, uh, um, the book talks about uh, vestigial sidebands, and that's again in the context of realizing a, uh, a Hilbert filter. And then and that's all fine and good, and it's easily explained, but, there's, but for that mathematics, there's a really much, much better uh, uh, a uh, physical system, physical example, and I'll, 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 I'll concentrate the math on that one and then leave it up to you to say, aha, the math is exactly the same as, uh, as what Yassi does for, for VSB. Okay? So, so that, that's, that's what we'll do today. But I had a request, and I think it's a very, very good one, to kind of hit the high points of what we did last time. So without, without really bringing in too much, um, uh, without writing anything down, what I want to do is I want to I talk about um, kind of the... the uh, and not, and not in order, I want to talk about um, uh, some, uh, uh, some high points. And then the first, the first thing I'll talk about today, uh, since it, it dovetails into, into what I want to, um, into the next section, is what, what exactly is the Hilbert transform? And so you see that on this, on this slide here, from, yes, from last time, we, have an, we, we discovered an integral. We discovered an integral. And it turns out that this integral is the Hilbert transform of the function m of t. Okay? So from a mathematics perspective, if all you cared about was collecting all the really, really cool transforms there are in the world, then this would be, this would be one of them. And this one has a name. It's called the Hilbert transform. And so if, if people say, what is the Hilbert transform? Well, this, is, this integral tells you exactly what it is. If you're a mathematician and, not, and, not, and, 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 and your world does not really necessarily care about one or two different applications, 
uh, but barely just, just, just mathematics for its own important sake, then this is, this is what you would get when you, if you talked about what a Hilbert transform is. And so that is, that's just as good a place to start as any. And so I didn't do it last time, but I'll, I'll just point to that today as a starting place and say there's fun, fact, fun math fact number one. Okay? Now, <coughs> now we're more sophisticated than, 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 than that, and we, we have a, a lot of experience with signals and systems. And so we take a look at the form of that, and we say, well, look at the inter look at the limits of integration minus infinity and infinity. Look at the way the um, look at the way the uh, the tau's the dummy variables work relative to t. What that what that suggests to us is that that's a convolution between two functions, between two signals. That's a convolution between two signals, and the two signals are m of t and the and one and the and the function one over pi t. So there's your one over pi out in front, and there's your t minus tau. Um, uh, flipped around uh, uh, inside inside the integral. So this this is in fact um, so this from from here we can say aha well we have a we have a convolution integral uh, that we that 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 that, um, that takes care of that and that gives us a little bit more of a physical interpretation if we say well gee you know if I if a convolution is between a signal and a filter or a signal and a and a and a, and a, and a linear time variant system well here's my here's um here's now I can draw block diagrams I can draw a block of a signal a message signal coming in to a block that has a has a um, uh, impulse response of one over pi t. The output of that is a convolution, and there's a there's a vocabulary word word called Hilbert transform that we use to apply that to. Um, the other thing to point out is is okay. We know we, we hate doing you guys hate doing convolutions. I think I think we we I, I relearn that every single time I teach this class. I try like the dickens to, to, to fight you on that, and I will continue to do so because I think convolutions are fun and exciting to do. Um, so, but but we we know that you know that if I have a convolution in the time domain, then I have a, a multiplication in the frequency domain, and so it turns out that a Fourier transform pair happens to be 1 over pi t, Fourier transforming to uh, the signum function, the signum function, which is like a step function, but on steroids, okay? And the steroids is parity, okay? So, so instead, of a, instead of a step function going up and, and, and over, it's a, 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 a signum function is, is, is odd. It goes from minus 1 to positive 1, and so you can see it has, has odd parity. The step function, unfortunately, is as nice as it is and as physical as it is, doesn't have parity. And so if you want, if you want to take advantage of parity, all those nice symmetries in your problems, then what, you, what, what, what you're encouraged to do is to, as I put it earlier, pick up all your U of T's, put them in a, a, paper bo a, a, a cardboard box, and shove it in the back of your closet, and then and only, play with, only play with signum functions. Okay, and so and so sigma functions happen to transform to happen to transform a Fourier transform to that one over pi t, which means that this convolution in the time domain is a multiplication in the frequency domain of the Fourier transform of the message signal with the Fourier transform of, of the impulse response of the Hilbert filter one over pi t, which is the sigma function. Okay, so in that in that nutshell, that's the mathematics. That's the mathematics of what we did last time, okay? The new mathematics being the Hilbert transform, the new mathematics being the, um, the Fourier transform pair, signum function to 1 over pi t, and, and the relationship, of course, between the product and the frequency domain and the convolution in the time domain, okay? So really, really, and if you look back at table 3.1 and 3.2, you'll see the Fourier transform pair, and you'll see the, 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 module, the, the convolution property, Okay, and so and 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 and, and I think and even uh, Lati early on um, uh, introduces a signum function, but now we and but but we we got along with U of T so well, and now now's the first time we really need to need to mess with the signum function. Okay, so don't get too stressed out about that. Now, we the way we used it last time, the way we used it last time was in signal sideband, and we noticed that um, we noticed that m of omega uh, was symmetrical. Because of the nature of uh, because of the nature of m of t being a, a real voltage, uh, that gave you symmetry when you Fourier transformed it into the frequency domain, and because it's because um, because it's symmetric, uh, when I when I when I beat this with a with a local oscillator, when I mix this with a local oscillator, when I when I modulate it, uh, amplitude modulate it, I have a, I have much higher bandwidth. I go from I go over four pi b instead of just two pi b. 
And that's inefficient because I'm, 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 I know what, the, what, the, what this guy is doing if I know what this guy is doing. So if I make a measurement of this, then I don't need to make the measurement here. I know exactly what it is. And so, and so how can I reclaim that real estate in frequency space in order to be able to, in order to, be able to send twice, two, two signals instead of one signal or other, other things? And, that's what, and that was the motivation that we used for QAM. And it's also the same motivation that we do for single sideband. The two techniques are really quite related. Um, just, different, just different coding theory and different ways of, of, of achieving essentially the same result as far as I see it. So if I, if I break up this guy here into, into, into a, an upper sideband, then I'll break up this into a lower sideband. And I have a bunch of... Cons conservation rules that I have to apply, such as m plus plus m minus is equal to m of om. And that's true in the time domain or the frequency domain. And from there, I can guess at a form for the message signal m plus of t and m minus of t. They have to be complex conjugates. I was very proud of you guys. You came up with that last time uh, with, the, with, the, with the thought. And so, and so what that does is that tells us, well, geez, if we only know what this NH of T, the complex part of that, of, that, of that thing, then we know everything we need to know. Okay? You go through, you go through that. You use your step function. You turn your step function into a signum function. Now you get, now you recognize the signum function. You recognize a product, a product in the frequency domain of m of omega, the Fourier transform of the message signal, with that signum function, you recognize that the inverse, that the, that the uh, tra inverse Fourier transform of that is exactly what we're looking for, which is the complex part of, of m plus of t, the Hilbert part. And from there we get, it, we, 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 we derived, or we, we uh, developed uh, the, the Hilbert transform integral that we started this review with. Okay. And that's all. That's really all we did. That's really 90% of what we did. We, the other things we did was we looked a little bit at, you know, what it, what it what it might look like in a block diagram. We looked at at a at what is a Hilbert filter. Um, I I do like this do like introducing this concept of an all pass filter to you guys. It's a class of filters, and the Hilbert is an example of that. And, 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 and we, so we looked at the amplitude part and the phase part. The phase part told us how to actually calculate these guys. Here's an example for, the, for what a cosine is and what a sine, of, sine is, the Hilbert transform, or a cosine and sine. It's really nice because if I have an arbitrary signal and I do the Fourier series, I can term by term do this phase shift and, 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 uh, and calculate my Hilbert transform that way. So this is a powerful result. And then, and then, and then um, we uh, we looked at the use of SSB and, and AM. I noticed that when I when I looked at my um, when I looked at my uh, movie last time on Course Echo, I was just writing down these higher harmonics, and I hadn't said yet that the, the obviously the low pass filter gets rid of those and produces our signal M of T again. So we so we've proven that we can use this this uh, Hilbert transform technique. Uh, this the Hilbert filtering technique for uh, an amplitude modulation signal. It's called signal sideband, and it does in fact allow us to recycle um, the bandwidth and, and, shoot and, and use, use, you put another signal on the same frequency. The, the, um, the motivation for that is twice the revenue. I can now resell that bandwidth uh, uh, to two customers instead of one. And that's, that's, that's the way, tell, that's the way uh, carriers think. Okay. Yes, sir. So QAM was using half the bandwidth as well. The realization of that was, and the approach to that was, is related to this. It's still phase dependent, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, different, it's a different approach. What we did there was we said, okay, a sine and a cosine are 90 degrees out of phase. 90 degrees is that magical, magical orthogonal angle. It's that magical orthogonal angle for which there's no dot product. That, that there's no, if I take the dot product, there's no, no projection. Therefore, those, they're linearly independent. That, that the information on the cosine, the information on the sine is perpendicular, independent, no crosstalk, no, no um, 
uh, yeah, you don't, you don't, you can, you can use it twice. Oh, you mean so like sending um, one message signal on a cosine carrier and then the other message signal on the question is, that's exactly right. You, you, you use a cosine for, one, for an M1 of T, mm -hmm. and you use the sine of that local oscillator for M2 of T. Okay. M1 of T is you speaking, M2 of T is you speaking. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I sell the cosine to you, I sell the sine to you, and, and, and off you go. Okay. And unless there's an impairment, and remember we looked at some impairments, that where, where, where a little bit of your signal crosses over, if cosine and sine are, are a little bit off frequency or a little bit off phase, that angle bends. And now you've got a small pro dot product projection. Okay, and then so, so you, can, you, you, can, you can hear each other's conversation at times. Yes? And the review that you just went over, sir, is the transmission side, the application of helper filters on the transmission side. Okay, so yes, you would put the, so the, the question is, um, uh, the, is, the applic is the Hilbert, where does the Hilbert filter belong in a, in a single sideband system? And yes, you, you code it at the transmission system. And then the last little bit, the last couple of th lines that I did um, at the end of class was showing that I could demodulate. Showing that, that, that if I had this signal, um, then I could, I could, I could de actually demodulate it and recover my baseband message signal uh, for that. I, I recommended that you, you do this, so that you, you fill in some of the steps here. And also you do the lower sideband. You, you, you build a receiver so that you actually can look at the lower sideband as well. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 by, and, and just, you know, again, not to, not to scare you, but that's the kind of... It's, it's that kind of development that would make a really good question to probe that you know, you know the AM systems pretty well. Okay? All right. Any other questions from last time? I went through a lot. I went through a lot of review just in the last few minutes. And I want to do it again. And that's, that's sort of the point of, 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 of the main part of today's lecture, which is I want to look at, I want to, I want to, I want to look at causality. Okay? You know, you know that concept of, of, a, of a transfer function or, a, or a, an impulse response of a system being causal. If a system is causal, that means it does not start before time t equals zero. If I hit a spring mass system, if I hit a spring mass system, um, it's not going to start oscillating before that hit comes, before that delta function comes. Okay? Now, if I, if I, if I go after you and I, I'm about to, to strike you with a delta function, you... You know, you'll, you can anticipate that. But we're not talking, we're talking about inductors, capacitors, resistors, you, you know, and they're, 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 they're dumb in the sense that they won't anticipate. You have to work them really hard to make them non-causal. And, and even there, it usually, usually has to do with us adjusting the time, the time scale, not them. Okay? So most, most physical systems are causal. Are causal. Um, I, I, introduced, I, I reminded you of this thing called the Hilbert transform from the math, the, math, the math concept of a Hilbert transform. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this causality, I'm going to use the Hilbert transform, and I'm going to develop something that you've seen before, but you've probably never, never thought of, and certainly never named. How many, to how many of you does the name Kramer's Kronig relations mean anything to you? Rings a bell. Rings a bell. No, no hands, and 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 that's exactly that's exactly the way I, I I I I expect. But let me ask you a different question. If you have a an LRC circuit, okay, and I tell you that, or just even a, a low pass filter, just even simpler. I have a low pass filter, and I and I tell you, and I tell you the three dB spot of that of that of that filter. What do you know about the phase? Can you sketch the phase? If I tell you, if I tell you where that where the low pass filter turn, rolls over, yeah. yeah, and it's not it's not just because you've looked at it again and again. Supposing I have a low pass filter, and I have a I have a I have one rollover point, and then I have another rollover point. What happens has to happen at the phase every time I have a rollover point, every time I have... Okay, so I have this guy here. 
And now supposing I have, I have another stage of my filter, which, which gives me, if this is 10 dB per decade, now this is another, this is now 20 dB per decade. What do I know about the phase response here? Anything? 15. Well, I have a phase rollover here, and then I have another phase rollover here as well. You get a 90 degree phase shift every time you hit one of these one of these turnovers. Okay. In other words, for for and 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 maybe it'll become clearer to you after I point this out. You're one of the reasons that you think, in terms of a of a of, a, of the magnitude being important, is because for most systems, most simple systems, LRC space systems, and 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 and, and, and causal systems, the the phase response follows. If I know one, I know the other. If I know the phase response, I know the magnitude response. If I know the magn magnitude response, I know the phase response. Okay? And that's what I want to prove today. Okay? So, causality, that's the first thing we want to think about. Okay? And just to remind you, a causal system does not respond until it, until it is stimulated. Okay? The example that I gave you on the test was non-causal because h of t began before t equals zero. And the delta function comes at t equals zero to generate the h of t. So that was a non-physical system. That was a non-causal system, anticipatory system. So h of t is equal to zero for t less than zero. That's, the, that's, a, that's an observation or a definition of what ca a causal system is. Since the delta function comes at t equals zero, then h of t had better be quiescent or zero prior to that excitation, prior to that thwap of the delta function. Okay? And if I draw that, I'm going to draw it in the time domain, and I'm going to draw the shape that looks like that. Okay? That's, that's a shape I usually do for, that's a shape that I use for the upper sideband, right? But, uh, but please, I'm not doing that today. I'm, I'm, I'm doing time. This is the time axis, not the frequency axis. So this is a causal system. This is H of T. So the delta function comes right here at zero. Okay? So before zero, before time T equals zero, H of T is equal to zero. And I'll also, I also will show, say that h of omega is equal to the integral h of t e to the minus i omega t dt. That's the Fourier transform of the delta function. It gives me my transfer function. And what do I know about h of omega? It's complex. And the reason it's complex is because h of t is single-sided in time. Okay? So this is, this, is, this is complex. Now, I'm going to take H of T and I'm going to split this up into, its, um, into an even part and an odd part. I can always do that. I can always do that. If I, um, if I have to sketch these, then the even part looks like this. The odd part looks like that. And now you can see that you can see that if I add these guys up, I'll get h of the t on the right hand axis, and these guys will cancel out. Okay, so that's what that's what I'm doing when I separate that into an even part and an odd part. And we know from the homework assignments and and and, and even the exam question, um, it was pure coincidence. Um, 
that I can write this Then I can write this as h of t plus h of minus t. That's my even, and my odd does that. Okay. So if I look at if I look at the, the, the this guy and this guy, and I look at this guy and this guy and this guy, everything makes sense. That's what that's what I, that's what we're doing when we when we when we break that up like that. Now take a look at um take a look at this guy here, if I want to turn, if I want to turn this even function of t into an odd function of t, can anyone think of a fun and fast way to do that? Almost. What's my new, what, what, what did I tell you to do with a step function? I told you to take your step function and throw it in the, in the back of your closet. So the thing, you, the, thing you, the thing you want to use, and you're, 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 you guys are both on the right track, if I multiply this guy by a signum function, or half, a, half of a signum function, then, if, or even, if, actually, no, I'm sorry, if I rotate, multiply this by a signum function, the right-hand side stays the same. The, the negative time gets flipped across the axis down. So, both of, both of you guys um, recognized That the, that the odd part was equal to the signum part times the even part. The signum function times the even part. Okay? That's a pretty nice observation. It's a pretty powerful observation. Because what it allows us to do What it allows us to do is it allows us to write the, the, tra the impulse function, the impulse response, as 1 plus the signum of t times the even part of t. Okay. Now, notice that we had, last time when we were doing single sideband, we had something that looked very much like this. We had a 1 plus signum of, of, of omega multiplied by, 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 um, by, a, by something in the, in the by, by m of omega. Okay? Now, we have, now, we're, now we're doing this multiplication in the time domain. And remember, if I multiply something in the time domain, what is it in the frequency domain? If I take two signals and I multiply them in the time domain, what are they in the frequency domain? Okay. The crowd is yelling out convolution. I have to say that because you guys' comments don't always make it onto the recording. But you're absolutely right. Convolution. So, Fourier transform this. The even part of t, I'm just going to call g of omega. So let me be explicit about that. The Fourier transform pair, there's a, there is a Fourier transform pair E of t with g of omega. Okay? I, e of t can be anything because h of t can be anything, right? So I don't, I don't know yet what E of t is. But I, I, well, E of T is specific to my problem, specific to whatever problem that I have at hand. But I do know that it, it will have a Fourier transform. So H of, the G, H, of, H of omega is equal to 1 times E of T transformed. That's G of omega. Plus, now G of omega still hangs, it hangs around because that's that Fourier transforms to there. What's the, now, what is the... Um, what is the uh, um, Fourier transform of the signum function? 1 over t times a bunch of constants. 1 over t times a bunch of constants. There's a pi in there. There's an i in there. It turns out that it's... Um, 
I minus 1 over pi omega. And the product here becomes a convolution in the frequency domain. Okay. So before we had a 1 over pi omega. I'm sorry, we had a 1 over pi t convoluted with a, with a, a time varying function. Now we now we're, we we have uh, since we started in the time domain instead of the frequency domain, we now have a convolution in the frequency domain. And what I want to do is I want to write that as the form of h of omega that we knew all along. That is, h of omega is is, has, is a complex is complex. Okay. So I started with h of t because of the single because of the lack of symmetry. H of omega is complex, and all I've done is written that h of omega is complex. Okay. There's the real part and there's the imaginary part. If I want to do the magnitude of h of omega, what do I do with g of omega? If I want the magnitude of h of omega, square both sides, g of omega squared plus what? B of omega squared. Then what do I do? Good. And then if I want the uh, phase of h of omega, inverse tangent of what? The imaginary part over the real part. And, and you've done this a million and three times, right? And so all, I, so all I'm doing is just calling what the real part is and what the imaginary part is, uh, G and B. But notice, that, notice the relationship. Notice the relationship between the Hilbert transform and B of omega, Okay. So the imaginary part is equal to the convolution of g of omega with this function 1 over pi omega, which is the Hilbert transform. The imaginary part is the Hilbert transform of the real part of H. Huge. Huge, because what that says is that I can write explicitly the convolution integral, and if I, I could, I could go back the other way, and this is something that you could leave a few lines in your notes and, and fill in. I can also just as easily show. Oh, minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, B of omega over omega prime minus omega, D omega prime. So if the real part is the Hilbert transform of the imaginary part, then the imaginary part is the Hilbert transform of the real part. Yeah. Sure. If I flip it around, I'm going to change this minus sign. I'm not. A, I'm not that's 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 where whether J is in the numerator or the denominator. So if you if you keep track of that, that's going to be that's 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 part of it. There's another question floating around. I think. I mean, this is a pretty this is a pretty neat result if you think about oh, how many times you've looked at in in filters. In your in your in your in your um, networks course, in your signals and systems course, in your and now in com systems course, um, you've looked at you've looked at uh, real parts and imaginary parts of transfer functions, 
a lot of times, this is a pretty, pretty cool theorem that says that if I know the imaginary part, I know the real part. If I know the real part, I know the imaginary part. Under what assumption? That it's what? That it's causal. If it's a causal system, that is, if it's a real physical system, a resistor is not going to see the delta function coming. You know, it, it, they're just, it's just a dumb piece of carbon wrapped on paper with some wires glued to it. <laughs> yes, sir? Like basically taking the Hilbert transform is just doing a phase shift of negative pi over 2. Yes, yeah, so, so again, if you want to evaluate these integrals, if you, want to, you, can, you, if, you want, if you want to do the Hilbert transform, you have several approaches. One approach that I showed you last time was to take, the, um, for example, the signal g of omega prime and expand it into a Fourier series in time and then flip the phase in time and then, and then, and then, and then that, that's a representation of, of g of omega. The other thing you can do, the other thing you can do is you can, you can take uh, the data for g of omega on, on a, um, you can take the data in, in the laboratory. You have to take a lot of it because you need from over all the frequency range of interest and then some. And then do the summation. Do the summation for omega minus omega, omega prime minus omega over d omega. And so, and so, and so experimentally, that's often what's done is you may not have, you may not have phase information. You may not have a system that can measure phase, but if you can measure amplitude and you know your causal, then you can take enough frequency data and turn it into a, into a, a turn enough magnitude data over enough frequency and turn it into, um, and turn it into a, the phase response. For example, the uh, instruments, um, the instrument that you use upstairs to look at the voltage as a function of time is called an oscilloscope. An, instru an instrument that you use to look at that voltage as a function of frequency is called a spectrum analyzer. And when you go out into the RF, spectrum analyzers are easier to build than oscilloscopes. But most spectrum analyzers lack phase information. And so, and so you, the spectrum analyzer would only give you a power spectrum and then if you want to reconstruct the phase, you have to make, a, you have to make a, uh, a, um, an assumption about your device under test being causal. And if that's and simple and if that's the case, then enough spectral data from your spectrum analyzer will allow you to calculate the phase resp response in this way. Okay. Another example. How ma remind me how many of you have taken or are taking um, electromagnetics? practically the whole class. Most of you, I think, are taking it now. That's my guess. Um, you may have come into, you may have studied already uh, something called the dielectric constant. And you may also um, have studied uh, the fact that that, comp that dielectric constant may be complex. There may be a real part to that dielectric constant and an imaginary part. The real part I usually call the index of refraction. That's good to a square root. Square root of epsilon r is the index of refraction. Okay, one, uh, and then the um, the uh, and so you can imagine a material. The I'm sorry, the epsilon, the complex part of epsilon is the loss. Okay, I'm going fast. You'll have to think about a plane wave with a propagation e to the i k k z. Inside of k is epsilon. The real part is the oscillatory. The imaginary part is, the, is an exponential decay. So I have the index of refraction and I have loss. And they're related to each other because a block of glass is just a block of glass through the kramers kronig relations, these integrals. Okay? And when you're working with optical signals, it's sometimes easier... It's sometimes easier to measure one versus the other. No, in the numerator. <laughs> in the numerator of the of the bottom. Yes, absolutely right. Otherwise, it'd be silly. I could just I could just uh, pull it through the integral, right? Uh, 
Uh, what are the applications of these equations? Okay, so there's a couple. Um, what I mentioned, uh, you have a, a, a RF device under test, mm -hmm. and you're stuck with an old with a spectrum analyzer instead of a network analyzer, and you want to fully characterize it. So you take enough you take enough uh, magnitude response over enough frequency range, and then you numerically do this integration, or if you, you curve fit and do this integration. Another, another um, example comes from electromagnetics, where you're characterizing a material that your plane wave is propagating through. That plane wave is propagating, it's, it's, it, it, so it's, it has an index of refraction, or an epsilon r, and it has a, it has a loss. Um, and so, and so one, the, re the real part of epsilon is uh, the phase shift, or the index of refraction. The imaginary part is the loss. If I measure one, I can calculate the other. Okay, and that and but that not, and that it's that community. It's in that community that this Kramer's Kronig relations really really comes into play. I believe it also holds. If you look at um, quantum physical electronics, if you look at the quantum devices, uh, you have very you have very very similar situations there um, of a of an electron wave going through those structures. And again, that's characterized by, by a resonance or an absorption or a loss and, and also a, um, a phase shift. And so the one would beget the other as well. Okay? So, so it's a very, it's, um, and, and, it, and it rolls back to what I was saying, suggesting before, at the very beginning, which is, if I know my filter, if I specify my filter response, as long as I know where my 3 dB points are, as long as I know where these zeros or, or the poles are, then I know what's happening in the magnitude and I know what happens at the phase. Okay? So the ability to, the ability to, 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 to see these breakpoints, know that something's happening in the magnitude and the phase, is a consequence of this mathematics. Okay, much easier to, to look at the intuitive result from the Bode diagrams, but this is the rigor on which that's on which that, that that's based. Okay, so again, very 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 similar mathematics to what we did with a single sideband. Very similar mathematics. The Hilbert transform and the relationship between out pops, out pops the relationship between the imaginary part of the of the transfer function and the real part of the measure, of the transfer function. Okay, so wherever you have a transfer function, this could this may, if you need it to be, be applied. If it's a causal if it's a causal system. So that's what I mean by causality. A causal system, Hilbert transformation, yielding the Kramer's Kronig relations between the imaginary part and the real part. Okay? I offer it to you in two, for two reasons. One is, the most dominant one is, we just, we just did all this math for single sideband. And here's another use of it. Okay? We did it in the frequency domain, and now we're doing it in the time domain. Okay? And then, and then as electrical engineers who've taken how many courses with transfer functions? Here's an, a fun, another fun little um, math fact about those transfer functions that you've, that you've had, had so much fun with over the semesters. Okay? And just kind of fits, I just think it kind of fits well into it. Okay, I have to be very clear what we do next. We're going to finish up uh, AM with a look at, well, Lati calls it vestigial sideband, and I'm not, okay? But I will emphasize that this comes from, this comes from, um, this comes from a, uh, uh, um, section 4.6. The mathematics set comes from section 4.6. Okay? But I'm going, to set it up, I'm going to set this up in a very, very different way. I'm going to set this up in a very different way. Um, 
I'm going to go back to our basic, basic, basic system. Well, I have a mixer, a local oscillator of a carrier, cosine omega CT, and a message signal M of T, and I mix them together. Okay. Double sideband. And then I'm going to go into a channel, and then I'm going to come out the other side, and I'm going to receive that signal. And I know that when I receive that signal, I should mix it with the cosine omega CT, or if I'm not T, I'll multiply by 2. Okay. And then I get out what I get out. And we know that this works for, the, for a perfect channel, a channel equal to 1. That I'll, I'll put in an M of T, and out will come to within a factor of 2, M of T on the output. I have to low pass filter, right? I have to do a low pass filter to get to get rid of the higher harmonics. Typically, if I'm working with these carrier frequencies, I'm going to low pass filter whether I want to or not. Right? I'm going to have to I'd have to work hard to keep that frequency content. So, you know, that's that's sort of almost a given. But but supposing I have a linear time invariant channel with a delta function response h of t. Okay. Supposing I have a linear time invariant channel that's not equal to 1, but actually will affect the frequency content. So there's a, a, swing, a set of frequencies go through here. Some of those frequencies are attenuated relative to others. And some of those frequencies are phase shifted relative to the others. Okay? So, so this, 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 this channel, this channel has, is a filter. Okay? Now think about, again, we'll, 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 step, we'll step across into your EMAG class. Have you guys had transmission lines yet? Started. Just started. Okay. Well, today or tomorrow or the next week or the next week after that, you'll see that a transmission line can be, can be broken up into, into um, a string of capacitances and a string of inductances. Okay. So the wire connection, you learned that yesterday. See, just in time luxury. This is this, I, may not, I may not be synced at all with the laboratories, but, but your unrelated EMAG course, I'm pretty in sync with. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, you, you, the wire part of your transmission lines the wire part of your, the center conductor of your coax BNC cable has an inductance associated with it. I like to think about that as a kinetic energy. The, the connection between that inner conductor and the braid, there's a capacitor there. I like to think about that as the potential energy. Okay? Even if you think about your plane waves propagating in free space, you've got an epsilon and a mu, your epsilon is farads per meter, and your mu is Henry's per meter. So there's your capacitance and your inductance right there. So it's not too much of a stretch to say my channel, if it's going to have a coax in it, if it's going to have propagation of an EMAG signal in there, is going to have, is going to have this filter response. L's and C's and losses make R's. LRCs are what you do to make band pass filters and low pass filters and high pass filters. And so it's not a stretch to say that a channel, be it the atmosphere or be it a coax cable, is going to behave like a filter. Okay? And if that's the case, then it's going to have a filter response. H of T, and I'll fill in the gaps. The transform of that is going to be the transfer function H of omega. So, I'll be a little confusing with my notation, but I'll call the, I'll call that channel transfer function H sub i because that'll be the input into my, 
into my receiver. Okay? That'll be my input into my receiver. This H sub I, again, to emphasize exactly what it does to that signal, that H sub I is going to take the, some of the frequency components and attenuate them. Maybe all the frequency components, but some more than others, potentially. And for a given frequency component, it's going to shift it in phase. One part of that phase will be the transit time to get from here to here. Eight inches a nanosecond in a coaxial cable. A foot a nanosecond in free space. Okay? That's, what, that's my... I love that. A foot a nanosecond a gigahertz. Okay? It's a little slower in a transmission line, so it, does, it goes a little slower. Eight inches only. Anyway... That, so I have a certain delay, but then some frequency components see more of a delay than others, and so, and so it pops out the other side. So I've messed up my signal. I've distorted my signal, but in a, in a fairly benign way, in merely a convolution. And it's perfectly reasonable to imagine, especially in this day and age, that I can characterize H, H, HI of omega. Okay? In fact, this is done all the time. Your DSL, if, if, you're, if you have a DSL modem in your, in your, in your, in your apartment or in your, in your house, what's happening when you're not using it is it's, te it's sending test signals back to the, to the local office. The, and, 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 and it's pinging it with waveforms that characterize HI of omega for the precise cable between your apartment and the local, office, the local office, the central office. And that's going to change as a function of time of day, as temperatures shift the impedances around. And if, if, you're, if you plug in a, a, another phone into a jack or something, load the transmission line in different ways, your neighbor gets online, it's going to change it again. And so this HI of omega is changing. And by, by testing it and by pinging it, you can do stuff here and you can do stuff here to adjust for that or to compensate for that. Okay? So in this problem, in this problem, what, we, what I ask or what we ask ourselves here is I want to put in a filter on my receiver that gets me close to this guy here to recover my M of T. And so, in fact, I'll call that R of T, which is the signal that's recovered. Okay. And, and just for grins, I'll call this E of T going into my, um, my H output of T, of omega. So, let's see if we have this. I have, um, I've launched my signal psi of t here, which is m of t cosine omega ct. I have a, a, a frequency representation psi of omega. I go through my channel h of omega. And then I come back and I, I, I do my, my demodulation. And then I try to clean up my signal, h of omega. So, from transfer function theory, I know that my E of omega signal here 
is going to equal psi of omega. Oh, hang on. I'm sorry. Sorry. E of t. Sorry. E of t will equal psi of omega times h of omega. Psi of omega times h of omega. And that's, I'm sorry, that's going to be capital E of omega. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so E of omega here is going to equal H of omega times that of omega. Oh, wait a minute. Um, but I have to down convert that signal, don't I? Ugh. I'm getting confused on my notation because I'm, con I, I confu I'm going two steps ahead of Lati. I apologize for that. Um, Let me introduce the y of t here. The y of t, which is the out of the, which is out of, and this also, this will transform to capital Y of omega. Okay? Y of t <coughs> will equal psi of t times um, convoluted with uh, h of t, or y of omega will equal psi of psi of omega multiplied by h of omega. Then what I'll say is that e of t will equal y of t times cosine of omega ct. Okay? So e of t here will equal y of t times the cosine of omega ct. Just work backwards that way. I know that e of omega is going to be y of o omega plus omega c plus y of omega minus omega c. Because that's what this mixer will do. It'll split it in half, and it will throw half to the positive side and half back down to baseband. And so there's that. The recovered signal, the R of omega, the recovered signal R of omega will equal M of omega times H channel times the distortion of that, distortion of that, multiplied by H output of omega. Okay? So we have to be a little bit careful with the roles of these omega plus omega C's. But if you think of if you think about this, then this Y is going to be H at the upshifted frequency that operates on M of omega. Okay? So the recovered signal the recovered signal is this guy shifted multiplied this guy shifted multiplied by M of omega. So M of omega multiplied by the channel multiplied by the output that's going to be with the recovered signal. And we want this piece of it Therefore, we want this guy to equal 1. If that's the case, R of omega is equal to M of omega, or R of T will equal M of T. Okay? And so... 
H output of omega And this is equation 4.20 in LATI. Okay. How many of you read, have read uh, section 4.6 yet? Okay. Did LATI talk about channels at all? No. Lati, Lati does exactly this derivation. Lati does exactly this derivation. But instead of calling this a channel, he calls this block a, a, a bad filter, a transmitter. And what he says is if you're going to try and cleave apart the upper sideband from the lower sideband, you're not going to do a perfect job. And so there's going to be an additional imperfection of your filter and you want to model that imperfection of your input filter and compensate it for it on the, re on, the re on the receiving side. Okay? It's a good application. But the math is better and this is a better application. So it's exactly the same mathematics but I just, I've just redrawn the, the diagram a little bit. I've done that on purpose. Uh, yes? So It's, yes, it's a filter that, yes, that's a great way to put it. It's a filter that impairs the, it impairs the signal. And in, my, in, in what I'm saying, the way I'm, the way I'm presenting it is much more likely to come from the channel. Okay? So if it comes from the channel, it's obviously after the, the, the frequency conversion. And therefore, we have to, when we, when, we, when we correct for it at baseband, we have to take into account that shift. It's the output filter. Okay? It's the compensating filter. And so how do we, uh, how would the compensating filter adjust for HI? And since I'm using the brand of one transfer, one receiver, how do we get to the base? Let me explain this. So, so um, here's, <laughs> here's the function mathematically. Yeah. So the question is, how does, how, does this, how does this output filter work? Okay? And a, a mathematically oriented professor, and I am, but I'm, only, I'm not only that, would just merely point to this as an answer and say, right here, okay? This is the prescription for how you design the output filter to correct for whatever input filter you, you measure. In the context of today's transmission lines, what you do is you measure HI, you measure the HI by sending out waveforms, and then you reprogram in an adaptive way the poles and zeros, the transfer function of your, of your DSP chip. Okay? And, then, and, that, and, then, and, then, and, that, and that gives you your new revised filter on a minute-by-minute, hour-by-hour, day-by-day, month-by-month basis, however much power you have. But remember what you're really doing here. This is the more complete answer to your question, is what, what, what does this filter do? If I've got a filter, if I've got a frequency response, say at a kilohertz, and then I upconvert it to the, to the carrier, so it's now at a, a one megahertz, one kilohertz. That kilohertz, supposing that gets, that gets a, a, a 0.7 dB attenuation, and supposing it sees a phase, a, a phase response of half a radian, okay? On the output end, what I have to do that's where these pluses and minuses come from. I have to translate that one megahertz, one kilohertz back down to baseband. Okay? And so now I'm back at a kilohertz. And then I have to raise my signal, 0.7 dB. And then I have to move it in, in time. What did I say? How many radians? Pi radians? One half pi radians? Half a radian? Half a radian. I said half a radian. I have to adjust the phase of that by half a radian. And I have to do that for each and every frequency content that I, that I send. Okay? So that's all a filter is doing. Is a filter in the first place is it's attenuating some frequencies and phase shifting them. If I know what it's doing prescriptively, if I make that measurement, I can undo all that. Frequency component by frequency component by frequency component. I can undo that. So I can, I can pull 
frequencies ahead or behind and restore their amplitudes relative to each other. And that's what I'm doing here with the small exception that I'm doing one at baseband and the other gets distorted up at the carrier frequency. Okay? And so that, that, that's a, that, I think that's a more intuitive answer to your question um, than, than, than just... Than, but, but, both, but by the way, both answers are right and relevant. Okay? Okay. Any other questions or comments about all this? Is that another good way of thinking of a PID controller? The question was, is that another way, good way of thinking about a PID controller? And... I'm going to say, I'm going to say probably, but I'm going to have to think about that. I don't, I don't want to, I think so, but I, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to look at it a little bit more carefully. I'm not, I'm not I, I, have, I haven't thought of it that way, but that doesn't mean I'm, that doesn't mean it's, it's, you know, it's a good point. It's a good point. Okay. All right. Uh, we have just a few minutes and I'm greedy with my, with time. So I want to, um. I want to get us thinking a little bit about frequency modulation. Okay? So we'll now go into chapter five. And this is actually... Um, we'll talk about frequency modulation. We'll also talk about phase modulation. And those are fairly well-known terms. Those are well-known terms in the arts. I think you've all heard of frequency modulation. And phase modulation is, is not quite as famous colloquially, but it's very, very popular and, and, and there. And I must argue that um, these are special cases of something um, more, more general. And so the best name for that, that more general case is something called angle modulation. Okay? But it's a real shame because angle modulation has the abbreviation AM and we've already used AM for amplitude modulation and there's no way we're going to go back and change that, unfortunately. So we can't really... I, I might use the word angle modulation but but only because we're friends. So we can't really use that. So the next thing we'll do is we'll call it exponential. Exponential modulation. And that's, that's the word that we'll use in polite company. And the idea is, the idea is that, um, that a cosine can be represented as a complex exponential. And so we'll call it an exponential modulation even though it's it's unfortunate because we're really always going to be modulating the angle. Now, what we're going to be looking at are signals out of our transmitter. That's going to have be be at a carrier frequency cosine and we're going to put all the interesting all the interesting stuff inside the cosine. Okay? Now let me explain what I've done here. Let me explain what I've done here in a slightly different way. Way 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 back probably when you were in junior high school you were first introduced to things called sines and cosines. And the context in which you were introduced to them was triangles. You might remember that the sine was the opposite over the hypotenuse and the cosine was the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Did I get that right? Yeah. Pretty sure I got that right. Um, and, and so that ratio of the opposite over the hypotenuse was an angle. And the angle's unit of measure was radians. And sometimes you call them degrees. Okay? A part of a circle. Radians or degrees were part of a circle. Okay? So, so way, way, way back, you would write cosine. And I don't know if you, 
use Greek letters back then, but you, you probably didn't, but you would write now cosine of an angle theta. Cosine of an angle theta. And I want to remind you that every time we do that, things have not changed since junior high school, or I guess it's called middle school now, right? Sorry about that. This is still measured in radians and this is, or degrees. So before you can take before you can take the cosine of something, you have to make sure that it's in radians or degrees. Or and then that's a ratio. That's a ratio of, of, of one length over another length, or one voltage over another voltage, or so on and so forth. So this is this is just coming back from middle school. This is coming back from sixth grade, seventh grade, somewhere in there. And now what I'm doing is I'm saying your tri your triangle is wiggling with time. The triangle, that theta angle, is now varying as a function of time. Okay? And so that's, 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 that's where I'm going with this. And before we got used to that by writing something like a cosine omega ct. And in this case, every time t moved forward, my angle got bigger. What bigger? The number of radians, the number of degrees, just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I've already, I've already, there's two pi and then some, four pi and then some, six pi and then some. Okay? So, the way I want you to think about this over the weekend is the jump from here to here is the jump from a static angle measured in radians to an angle that's, that's now moving with time, that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger with time. Because at any instant of time, at any instant of time, I put in 17 nanoseconds, I multiply it by, by 3 gigahertz, 3.27 gigahertz, and I'm left with the number of radians, number of 2 pi radians, and then I take the cosine of that. And that's how I get the value of that number between, zero, between minus 1 and 1. Okay? But there's no reason, there's no reason why I'm, I, I should be stuck with very simple movements of my phase angle theta. In other words, I should be able to go up and back, forward. I should be able to sweep faster than slower, faster than slower, faster than slower. I should be able to do everything I want. I should be able to make any kind of excursion that I want with this phase angle as a function of time. Okay? And that observation, that observation gives rise to very, very, very nice coding approach that we call exponential modulation. Angle modulation is, is the more literal term that I think of. And examples of that are modulating the frequency or modulating the phase. One more thing. Cosine of omega ct plus theta. We recognize this as the, as the carrier. We recognize this as the, we can recognize this as a frequency. We recognize this as a phase. But what I'm saying is, if I wiggle that, I have a frequency modulation. If I wiggle that, I have a phase modulation. But in either case, I'm wiggling both. And... I, I'm, I'm, using, I'm, I'm doing that to my overall cosine. There's just, that's just notation. Okay? So next time what we'll do is we'll, we'll start with something that looks like this and we'll look at more formally what frequency modulation and phase modulation. But remember, all I'm doing is I'm saying the phase is unfolding, the phase angle is unfolding, that angle of the cosine I'm taking the cosine of is unfolding in strange and interesting ways.